It's for Allison. It's an honor to meet you. And an honor to meet you. Really enjoyed the interview that we did and love to flesh out some of the, the stories that you mentioned. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, you mentioned that your parents set up a slideshow with circular cartridges and shared their adventures with you. Can Can you share yeah. how those stories uh, shaped your view on storytelling and your approach to writing your book? Sure. So I think it was it was so fun because it was an event. You know, this is back in the day when everyone can't get on their separate device. Like everything was an event if you were doing any kind of viewing. And so I just loved seeing them travel the country and talk about their different experiences and show us the things that they saw. And I thought it was really cool that they didn't do it the traditional way. You know, they didn't like save up enough money until they could get into a hotel or something like that. They literally bought a tent and went camping all across Europe. So I think there's something really romantic about it too, of like a year long honeymoon in progress. And so just hearing that and the people that they met and the experiences that they had, I think that's always what's opened my eyes to being curious about other people and where they come from and what their story is and how the world treats them. And so I think all of that influenced um, my growing up and the book. That's great. So reflecting on the, the travels that you did as a child, how do you think experiencing different cultures, different diverse cultures, influence your approach to uh, to inclusion and diversity? Gosh, I think I think it impacted just everything about my world because I can remember traveling and thinking, you know what? What am I going to be when I grow up? And I went to the library because it was before Google and found out that there's a hotel school. And I was like, this is going to be the perfect way to travel the world for my whole life. And so that's how I ended up at Cornell in the hotel school. And so once again, like my eyes are opening up to like a whole other group of women that I met and became friends with. And, and, you know, and what I loved about it too, is that they were super direct. So I remember saying something that today could possibly be a cancel culture thing, like not really, but, you know, but they would say, you know what, Allison, that's not how you say that, or this is more appropriate. And so just learning all these different religions and experiences and, um, nationalities and things like that just helped shape me to educate myself a little bit more. So I think that was my first road into inclusion overall coming from my more sheltered hometown into, you know, a vast new world of sophisticated and broad-minded people. That's great. You mentioned that you you had a fondness for books or you have a fondness for books that reveal the hardships beyond the glossy interior. Yes. So how do you how do you incorporate the, this theme to the books to the books that you write? So I think, well, I think it's people, and I think this is a problem with social media too. Like if you're only getting the exterior superficial story of someone, whether it's me or you or anyone, you could get the wrong impression of what their life really is. But I haven't met anyone in my life that hasn't experienced some sort of hardship. And it's more, how are you dealing with that? How are you processing it? Are you a dweller? Are you a problem solver? Like we're all just very complicated humans. And so I think that that has uh, really impacted like a lot of the way that I think. And so into Lolly the Lobster, and it was one thing to write the kid's story about it, but it was also something really special to me to be able to write the back part of the book that was for adults, you know, like how do you help your child get through like a difficult time? Because I know from my own parenting, that's so hard because I'm a problem solver. So I just wanted to get in there and fix versus, you know, maybe at that time that child just needed some empathy and some like active listening. And so I think all of that has influenced everything I do, even my work life and career and how I approach people. That's great. So your your book has an important social message, but it's it's a uh, couched in like the whimsical in a whimsical tale. How do you balance like giving over an important message, but with like a a fantastic f fantasy whimsical story? Yes. So it started. Yes, it was a fun story. So you have this kernel of fun, like how does a lobster get in the woods? So that can be kind of entertaining. 
it's really important to pick the right illustrator because the words were so simple. And my girls, my daughters kept telling me, mom, like, keep it really simple. Keep the animals simple. Um, but I did base every character off of humans that I have met in my life. Mm. So for example, like the turkey. So I think we've all met some turkeys, <laughs> but the turkey in the book is based on people that value things such as power or status or being better than money, you know, all of those things of like somebody that looks down at you. So while the rhymes and everything were really simple, I really did base it on complicated humans. Um, the squirrel, for example, his reaction to Lolly needing help was out of fear. You know, like when someone's very fearful of how their life's going to be affected, then they react maybe more violently than, you know, someone else. So, so that's how I kind of tried to get the messaging in. And again, I think that's why the back of the book was so important to me because a lot of it could be lost if you just enjoyed the story and the illustrations. That's great. Um, was it, was it difficult uh, transitioning from, you know, a, a high powered uh, executive career to, to being an author? It was, I don't think so. Um, I love to work. I absolutely love my job. It's an incredible place to work. But we all have our little side hustle dreams or side hustle activities, right? For someone, it might be golf or tennis or some sort of sport. And for me, I think every time I'm in a stressful place, I turn to more creative outlets and so I think this was just one of those outlets and the story had been rattling in my brain and because it had a bigger message to it, I think that really fueled me to want to get that out of, yeah. And especially with all the anti DEI rhetoric or it's just, it's, a, it's very fundamental basis. It's really about how are we treating each other as humans and how are we understanding someone else's point of view? And so because that message was so important to me in the times that we live, it really motivated me to just sit down and write and not just write it, but really like share it because it's one thing to do something and you're doing it for yourself. But when you put yourself out there, it's very vulnerable. And so I had to be brave, kind of like Lolly and say, okay, I'm really going to share it with the world and let's see what people think. It's mm. really beautiful. Can you share, share with us a little bit more about the organization uh, eat, 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 Laugh, Give and how that developed and what, what it's accomplished? Sure. So that's that's actually one of my creative side hustles, I'd say. Um, but in the pandemic lockdown, when we were all at home and everyone was having so many disappointments, right? So I had two daughters, one of which, you know, prom was canceled, graduation was canceled, all these things. Then I had my three nieces moved in because they were all at various schools, you know, same thing, college graduation canceled. And as a mom, it was really hard to watch because then there's the news, which was really bad. And so I was like, you know what, this is your world. So go cry it out, get your disappointments, you know, wallow in it. Let all like, those are your feelings. And then tomorrow we're going to sit down and talk about as a group, what can we do to help during a pandemic? And so when the brainstorming started, that's when we were like, well, gosh, everyone loves to eat. So we started with the cookbook. We named it Feeding Family, Feeding America. We set up like a little studio, if you will, at our dining room table. And everything that we made, we documented. And my 16-year-old at the time, she's now 20, photographed all the photos. And so everybody named and edited and all of that. And so I think that was such a special experience and moving forward for me as a mom and wanting to make sure it's one thing to talk about stuff or with my husband, but it's another thing to live your values. And so to be able to parlay that and to eat, laugh, give as a broader organization that we could all work on together is, is really how that happened. And so we started off with like more minor kitchen renovations, you know, like do people need things in their kitchen? Like it's really expensive at Target, isn't it? Like when you're buying a pot and pan or any kind of appliance. And then that kind of parlayed again into doing larger renovations. So it's not something we can do every week. Um, 
We've done four renovations this year, and then we'll start doing nominations for our next round of families sometime in the fall. Yeah, um, so you mentioned the, you know, the challenges of talking about a DEI, this like, you know, po politicized and polarized world. So how, how, how do you do it? Do we just like not just avoid using the word or how, how do, do we just soldier on and plow through it anyway? Or it I think, so I think one thing is like very broad, right? Like outside of our work relationships, when you're in just normal friendships or family and like that political talk starts happening, I think it's like taking a breath and being patient. I don't think I'm one of those people. I'm working on it every day. <laughs> um, but to just remember that not everybody knows what it's about and not everybody knows what actions there are and that it's not saying one group of people is bad or less than. This is just about helping people that may have had some barriers. And so I think conversation is really important. But I think DEI has a bad name because it's people are squishing it all together when it's really it's three very different concepts. I think there's been, you know, race theory introduced that that's part of it, like all these other things. And I think at its simplest which is why I had said when you asked me prior, like, what's something I would change? I would rebrand it to something else. I, I say humanity because that at its core, that's what it is. It's me understanding you, your viewpoints, your religion, your, you know, cultures and customs and being not just okay with it, but like helping you achieve those in the workplace, you know, like where you're just as comfortable as the rest of the people. So that's kind of how I feel about it. So no, do I think we should stop? No, but it is, you just have to do it very carefully and remember that every culture of every organization is at a different point and you introduce concepts that aren't threatening to people because that's, that's not creating inclusion either, right? To say that someone's doing something wrong. So I think it's just, it's a very careful thread of the needle of creating action and never giving up on that action. Mm. And so that's that's my view. Mm. That's great. I've heard lately people saying certain people are DEI higher. What's a good way to respond to that? It's, it's a very cutting, cynical phrase. What's a good, mm. is there a good way to respond to that? The person's a DEI higher. I, well, I, I think it depends, again, who is the person saying it, right, and how you approach it. But if someone said that to me, and I don't see that happening in the workplace I'm in, but if I heard that happening, I would say, tell me more. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that? Mm -hmm. What's making you view that? And and for me, to get to the heart of understanding others is questions. And so then you can peel back the onion a little bit and start addressing the specific things that they're saying. And yeah, I mean, that's that's really always been kind of my go-to is asking more questions. That's great. Beautiful. So do you have any visions for the future of, of future projects uh, for, for children or other books on a social impact? So I think... <clears throat> Well, yeah, I always have stuff rattling in my brain. Um, I think if I was going to do another children's book, it would be a series like Lolly would come back and like we would have some sort of conflict again and save the day. Um, Lolly and the dogs together or something like that. So I could see that. And I loved working with Sandy Sonke, the illustrator. So that was wonderful. Um, another book maybe would be just something along the lines of like the little things are the big things is mm. what I call it. Mm. And like how really small gestures can make a big difference to others. And so maybe incorporating that into some sort of like DEI hints and tips or something. Mm. Um, but yeah, but for right now I'm focused on Lolly making sure her message gets out into the world and yeah, I'm just excited to share her. She was in the window. I was walking. I'm in Maine this week and I was walking downtown with my girls and she was in the window of the toy and bookstore. And so like little things like that just excite me. <laughs> it's great. Amazing. 
Well, yeah. congratulations. I wish you continued Thank you. success and any really important work. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's truly my But pleasure. yeah, and I'm I'm just really um like thankful and grateful to you for spreading the word and amplifying good messages. It it really means a lot. Really my pleasure. You know, when we started, it was 2017, and it, it struck me that so much of the news is like junk food, where it's addictive, but it doesn't doesn't nourish you, doesn't make you feel full. Yeah. And I had, I had this vision, like, why can't we create content or where you it's addictive, but it makes you feel like feel like you gain something from it. Every every single article, you feel like you feel a little uplifted. So Yeah. that that's been our our. Uh, Our, uh, like our, you know, our, our goal and our vision. Yeah, well, you've done a great job. So, Thank you. Thanks yeah. so much. All right. Well, if you need anything else from me, just reach out.